Back up Swindle. Oh, did he miss? And yes. he's missed. What was this game of Hearthstone? It looked like either player was going to win at any given moment there, but both players just not just being shy of lethal. And honestly, the uh, the self kill on the uh, void touched attendant from Shiny Bear was clutch, right? Obviously, the uh, insane pushing the extra damage when there were two void touched on board was huge, killing one, and then the kill after Shiny Bear's turn was really strong because otherwise uh, they they were very dead, right? There was no question about that. Uh, you can see here, that's the one Void Touch, and this is the kill on her, her own Void Touch that really helped this out and really reduced the chances of that final little bit of uh, the push from Insane there to end the game. So many outs for both players across multiple turns, but that does mean the series is evened up. 1-1 uh, one, so, one now, so the Priest has gotten over the line. Insane killed one of the Void Touch to slow down Shiny Bear, and then Shiny Bear killed off the other Void Touch to huge, slow down really Insane. Game, yeah. It's so bizarre. Um, but we talked about it at the start, the Priest, I felt at least, and I don't necessarily have to lump you into my sinking ship, but um, that was the one that I thought might be dodgy. So this, this is absolutely series on now for Shiny Bear. Yeah, it's definitely tricky because this is where now the other two decks, the Death Rattle Demon Hunter and this deck, the Face Hunter, are really going to come into their own because they get to you know try and like prey on the Rogue and prey on the uh, slower handlock uh, that Insane has. So I completely agree. This uh, with the course of a single game win, this series might have just flipped on its head. All right, Shiny Bear. Uh, no time to stop hitting face though. This is the face hunter. This is the faciest of decks. At least the priest has a little bit of control. This is just all in face really, isn't it, Raven? You're obviously two or three turns fighting for board if you have to, but really you run out of stuff too quickly if you trade for too long. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's all really just get something out of some early game minions and then just push as much damage as possible. It does get tricky though, and Rogue is very capable of pushing Hunter off board early and quickly. And then after that, playing like one minion a turn from Hunter just does not keep up with Rogue. Okay, well, here we go. It's the Rogue versus the Hunter. It is very, very important with member Shiny Bear's other deck is the Death Rattle a Demon Hunter available. So you would fancy that's got every chance of getting a win. Okay, that is a pretty strong, uh, gen well, generically strong opening there for Insane. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do have to tweak your thoughts of strong openings against Hunter, because I don't think Insane would have been too upset with maybe uh, you know a couple of one drops, maybe a Plunderer. Now he has everything except the Plunderer. He gets to coin out the Octobot, and now there are no draws that can actually kill this Octo. Uh, you are very specifically looking for the Initiate on turn one into uh, Adorable Infestation, turn two, to kill an Octobot cleanly. Yeah, for the longest time when Rogue sort of came out, me being me, I really tried hard to only run one Shroud, but you just have to play two, mainly for, because, uh, you've said it a million times, if you don't get a field contact, you don't have a deck. Uh, is the short version. Obviously, you can go wide sometimes. But So Double Shroud, a little bit slow here, but the rest of it's pretty tasty. Oh, this is interesting. I assume the... The Olga Merchant push would be on the Divine Shield. I guess it's just the safety of killing the immediately stronger minions. It's just a little bit scary leaving this initiate with a Divine Shield there, but I guess overall it might work out with the same thing if you're expecting a spell. Yeah, I guess you get to take out two things instead of one, which means your your bad minions, your one-twos, are challenging this Divine Shield at least. So one of them will take out Shield, and then you'll find a way to remove the minion itself because it's only one minion. Whoa. Okay, so Shiny Bear decided. I, I was wondering whether you could even ever consider anything but Mancrick that turn. Right. Shiny Bear decides to just say, you know what? There's a minion on the board that can do more damage if I use a spell. So I'm going to use it. Aim shot down the middle there. And uh, that is, of course, going to buff that hero power and push three now. The only problem is hunter curves are very tricky to smooth out when you aren't just doing the natural curves, right? The one on one, two on right. two, three on three, four on four. So with this man quick might get a little bit tricky and might even have to wait till turn five to come down alongside a hero power if nothing else is drawn. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking you might have to play the man quick here because I think Shiny Bear's quite a way behind. I may be assessing that incorrectly, but it feels like she's quite a way behind. And take a chance on just hitting Enraged Man Quick to sort of swing it back in her favour because trying to stall this all day against Rogue often is just not going to pay off. Last game was different. Insane only had one or two cards. This time he's got yeah, a full hand. He's only got five cards, but it's a full hand against Hunter, put it that way. You're paying for my discretion. And so just going for the Enraged Man Quick might have been just one of Shiny Bear's few ways to actually get back into this, is how I saw it. Okay. Wrangler on four. Not yeah. bad. Rhino's the go-to. Again, really tricky choices here. These, it might look like a simple, oh, you just pick Rhino because it's Rogue, but it's also Rogue with about 100 more minions on board than you. So is Rhino swinging once really going to make a difference? So that decision uh, is a lot trickier than it looks there from, uh, from Shiny Bear. Insane has a lot of interesting trade choices here, right? He knows the Rhino is coming, so... I don't think you can play around it by just trading everything in, but you you could. But the dis the downside is he's got to play minions anyway, unless he's going to swindle. It's worth thinking about. Yeah, he's just going to get on play, play, keep wide boards, take one hit from the rhino, and move on with his life. I think. That's well, the thing here is he could get away with just playing the one thief, triple trading, and then the one thief has stealth, right? So it can't actually be run into by the rhino. I wouldn't yeah, hate fair. it. It's a very, you know, it's very deep in the considerations for that Rhino, but I wouldn't actually hate it overall. Yeah, I think if, if you're going that way, I think I'd have preferred the Swindle and then sort of put loads of things on the board for turn after so the Rhino has a choice. Um, so it wouldn't go face anyway, basically. But yeah, here it comes. But this is the other approach that I was mentioning with the Rhino pick and why picking Rhino was difficult in itself. Okay, you pushed some damage face. You killed a 1-1 sick but what about all the others you know like look at all the other minions that you're going to get damaged as well by the following turn so i do wonder here how much are we on four six twelve damage with fireball alone and the minions on board of course yeah it's far it's... away but insane probably will expect both of the two cards on the left to be direct damage because mm. i don't think you can put shiny bear on that being a man quick or a minion So he might think he's just dead on the backswing if he's not careful here. Yeah, very well could be. He, he's, well, he's dead on really... board, right? Sure, yeah, there's that as well. <laughs> there's still the hero there's still hero power, so if he doesn't clear anything, he's dead. Because the hero power's still buffed. And he's not close to comboing here. Yeah, I think this is probably just a fireball. Uh, maybe even just fireball into the uh, the plunderer just to make the trades a little bit easier. Gets to retain yeah. an extra minion to go face. And I think he needs to develop board. There's a, there's a strong chance he doesn't get to combo kill here. He may have to win this with the minions. Yep. And he's losing that race weirdly at the moment just because of how Hunter works from the hand. Oh, it's so slow. Ten, seven. And weirdly enough, I think this might have to be a hand dump here from Shiny Bear. Play everything except Quick Shot. How about the other way where... It depends how she feels she's doing, right? Because she could go Quick Shot Hero Power and hope to pick up Aim Shot. Oh, it still works. The Aim Shot still works. But not now it doesn't. Okay. But this is still the same, except you can potentially draw an additional card, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And this gets the minions on board. If you don't put the minions on board, then... Because Insane has to respect this, right? So Insane either has to trade away everything, which then doesn't push damage to Shiny Bear, or he has to win the game, I think, if he doesn't trade these minions down. Especially knowing you've got Another minimum minion. seven next turn, potentially even more. He's going to get rid of a lot of stuff here. This is my fear. Between the Shadow Step and the Orc Merchant, this board's going. And now Insane's ahead in the race. But I think that's I think fine, because I don't think Shiny's relying on this board winning the game. I think this was an empty the hand to try and get rid of... Uh, to, to open up quick shot opportunities here. But now she might just lose next turn. That's the problem for me. I enjoy arguing. Oh. Ah. 
neophyte. Big deal. So aim shot into the neophyte. There's two, three, four, five. That would leave only seven damage with hero power. And then the hero power will do six next turn with another three. That's nine. So Shiny would need five next turn. Just want to point out at this point, even though it probably doesn't matter that she would have won if she'd gone the other way. <laughs> that would have been lethal. But I don't what think if it was just quick whole... shot hero power. Yeah. Because it was buffed hero power, right? Last turn as well. And then she'd have got the, um, the seven again this turn to do the 14. That was the play I was looking at, but I can see in Sane's hand, I knew the board had a good chance of being cleared. In fairness to Shiny Bear, she did not know that, obviously. And she may still win it because that quick shot will still draw a card, like you said, and that could just be enough. Nothing to brain freeze. This might just have to be the... Uh, looking at just getting the field contact down. Can drop a Durant shield on it as well, and honestly, at this point... If Hunter's going to aim shot, uh, sorry, piercing shot you, there are better targets than field contact anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh my god. You still all merge. One mana, yeah. And then you hope. He assumes the hope position. This is a huge draw in the context of the match. So there's nothing that can be drawn, right? No one mana spell can be played. That's right. Yep. That's going to be not enough. Both players again getting extremely close. What is going on this series? Like getting us on the edge of our seats here, but Insane is going to be the winner, taking the win over that Hunter. And that means that he has Warlock left. And by no means is he safe just because he's 2 1 up, right? I think this Warlock can easily lose to Hunter. And it can easily take a loss to that Demon Hunter as well. Because Warlock normally wants to clear the board, say, with a Soul Rend once and not clear a board. And another board instantly appears as well. So that could be a bit tricky for the Handlock as well. Yeah, going to be very exciting to see how this goes. And again, it's the merits of Shiny Bear's lineup once that Priest is out of the way. And maybe I'm being too harsh on the Priest, but from what I've seen of it, I'm not. Um, but it's, with it's out of the way, every chance of getting this done still. But I'd still rather be in Insane's position here with the only needing to win once against, even if it is too hard matchups. I don't think the Death Rattle Demon Hunter is that hard a matchup because you do have excess removal in the handlock so you can afford to waste two cards killing one which sometimes you can't with the other decks yeah I, I think the trickiest thing is some of the openings from the death rattle demon hunter because if they play a uh, three drop then you say will either backfire or get hit for three or if you if you drain soul or remove it there might be a four drop hit in the board for example and then you're like well i just used my whole turn not tapping and I've not even strictly removed a minion, right? So that's where things can get a little bit tricky. And I do think there has to be some at least uh, confident play from Insane to just say, I'll let you have this board. Because one of the weird things is if you let the demon, the Death Rattle Demon Hunter minions just sit there, well, then the Demon Hunter has a handful of cards that they don't want to play. Uh, but we are going to dive into the Hunter matchup first. So we could talk about Demon Hunter if it becomes more of a thing after this game, if Shiny Bear can take a victory with this hunt. And, I mean, I'm asking the wrong person, but she should be able to, right? Hunter is a very, very good spot in this particular matchup. It is, yeah. It's, I'd be pretty confident. There are some draws that can really mess you up, though. I think if Hunter starts with the spells instead of the minions, then that's a little bit tricky because mm -hmm. obviously Warlock can heal and not really die to only spells from Hunter. And then you get to the point where Warlock has the mana and the cards to actually then clean up the minions and heal for a lot. So again, not the fastest opening here for Shiny Bear, but definitely not terrible. One drop, two drop, and then a Kodo Bane to refill a little bit later on. Yeah, on the assumption that everything will fill up in the meantime, which it absolutely should, the way that Hunter is built, uh, that Kodo Bane will actually most likely be quite a welcome card in the hand. Um, but already Shiny Bear with several decisions. Now my, my instinct here says to take the Wrangler, but... Only to fix the curve for as much as anything. 
It's strange though, isn't it? Because the two two drops now also kind of fix the curve, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, but you sure. get to Neophyte instead, which is interesting. And the thing is, if you wrangle into, say, Rhino, well, that's kind of pointless because you'll want to Kodo Bane on Curve as well. So I don't hate this. And now there's actually a one drop being picked up in the form of that Initiate. So Shiny Bear actually has a pretty solid turn now. I'm going to choose to push the one, not really respect the 1-1 uh, the one -one trade into a much more threatening minion along with a uh, Death Coil. So I just, just make an 8-6 when things go wrong, Raven. But it's slow, right? This is what used to be how you played against the Vanaheim I mean, and just ignore it and hope it goes away. Right. It might come back from a, a raised dead anyway. So rather than trying to get rid of the 8-6, just pretend it's not there is how I would deal with this. Whoa. Look at the confidence. <laughs> bam, bam. It was a relatively bam. easy kill there on the Anetheron. And Johnny Bear decided there's a relatively easy kill on Insane's face right now. So I'm going to go for that instead. Yeah, I mean, there's always a raised dead, right? They've got nine cards in their hand. They're going to have a raised dead so often to just do it all again. So rather than put the resources in there, just put the resources into the face. Make Raven happy. Loads of good things happen all at once. Uh, regarding the Kodo Bane, do you want to play this on five or do you want to weave in hero powers? Obviously, weaving in hero powers against healing isn't quite so amazing as well. Yeah, it's a <sighs> tough call, right? It, 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 it really is. Yeah, it's so tricky. Even like the skip on hero power this turn. I think Bone Chewer and Org Merchant oh, okay. is strong enough that you can afford to weave it in yeah. and decide again next turn whether to weave it in again next turn. It's really difficult because unless this Kodo Bane next turn draws exactly Demon Companion into uh, uh, Refa then you feel bad about Kodo Bane next turn as well. But the longer yeah. you hold off on Kodo Bane, the more you can't just go aim shot, quick shot, hero power dead. Really tricky. I, I think it's probably but... correct because the, the Kodo Bane's unlikely to, well, it's not going to stick on this board, right? It's too easy to deal with. So the actual body isn't a threat. So you're doing, I know you're drawing the cards, but you're doing practically nothing if you play it, I think. Given it's that funny she as had well, a but backup. Sorry. If she didn't play it, would have lost because there's coin battle master this turn. <laughs> good point that is also useful what can happen here there is just no removal at all for insane if he had any like if you had drain soul if you had touch any of that then this tamsin would have probably just ended this game because of that, I wonder if it... Oh, is it ever tap? I'm not 100% sure what the quest proc's on. Again, what's his read on what this Kodo Bane is? It's been there all game from the opening hand. Is it too much damage coming okay, in? Okay, coin scavenger. So this is a build around Rhino. Mm-hmm. Which I think makes sense, given, again, that, that Kodo Bane's been sat there. Oh. Okay. Right now... Tiny Bear cannot kill anything. And there's a Battleground Power Master in hand. Unless you're seeing something I'm not, Lorinda. No, nope, I'm with you. I'm seeing lots of things you're not, Raven, but nobody wants to hear what they are. <laughs> yeah, none of them positive. <laughs> none of them actually do anything wow, useful. Is that just going to be game? It is. There's, There's no way of removing this. There's just an 2 on board and no mana. And this is... Oh, it's different because obviously Shiny Bear would have been dead, but this is one of the drawbacks of Kodo Bane, is the more you delay playing it, the more you delay having those options. Battleground Battlemaster is going to hit the board and insane. It's not only going to take the victory in this game, but in this series overall. And you see a bit of relief on his face as well. I think he knows that game was probably a little bit easier to end than it generally feels like it should have been. So a big victory there for Insane getting the win over Shiny Bear and one that could have very easily gone the other way by that point in the series. So a huge congratulations as he goes 2-0 in the Swiss so far. Yeah, showing how good a player he is as well. Again, got pretty close. I can't remember specifics, but got pretty close to becoming Grandmaster sort of this time last year when he had a bit of a better run. But he's a regular 6-3, 6-2, 3 sort of player. Well, not 7-3 because we've not done 10 rounds yet, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. And there are a number of decisions in this match that if he'd gotten them wrong, he would have lost.
and I think he got every single one. Every single one worked out for him at the very yeah. end. I think he got them all right. Spotted quite a few complex counting situations where, okay, counting's not hard, but counting under the pressure when you've got many other things in your mind, <laughs> you're trying to weigh things up, and suddenly it's like that first priest game. Oh, if I kill this, she can't kill me. She needs one more damage. All that, even through a wriggling, all that sort of stuff has paid off. And I, yep, nice second round for Insane. Yeah, I think with Insane, and this is meant to be a compliment, but there was nothing super flashy he did, but every game looked solid. And that's what you want as a Hearthstone player. You want every game to just look solid play. Uh, and it gets you wins, as you could see now, as he goes 2-0 in Swiss. But as always, that is not the only match we are going to cover from the round. We have some more matches coming right up for you guys. But we are going to go to a quick break first. So don't go anywhere, and we'll be back with some more Masters Tour Stormwind. So you've bested a few bounties, and now your party is ready to challenge other players. Well, step on down into the fighting pit. I'm game designer Joe Killian, here to show you the ropes of PvP and mercenaries. Once you've unlocked and built a fighting pit in your own humble village, you'll be ready to get started. Inside, you can select from your teams and prepare, just like choosing a deck in standard. At launch, a mercenaries PvP match will consist of both players bringing a single team of six, and just like in a bounty encounter, defeating your opponent's entire party will secure victory. One key difference from other game modes is that you take your party into combat as is. That means the progress you've earned in mercenary levels, ability tiers, and equipment all play a direct role into your PvP prowess. As you can imagine, the matchmaking in Mercenaries is quite a bit more complex than other game modes, since it needs to weigh all of these aspects to ensure relatively even power levels. While you'll always be paired up against opponents with teams of similar strength, we love that these factors open up a ton of potential for unique asymmetrical matches. Now let's talk strategy for a moment. Unlike PvE, where you can gather some information on what you'll be up against, in PvP, your team will face a mixed bag of opponents with varying roles and synergies. You may find yourself up against a protector-heavy orc team, or thrown into a fiery foray of elementals and casters. I like to bring beasts and nature casters, so I have good coverage of all the roles and some powerful synergies. If you want to come out swinging with all fighters, that choice is yours. Players will earn daily rewards just for participating in PvP. But with great ratings comes great rewards, and at increasing milestones, you'll unlock more and more mercenary reward chests. However, unlike the ranked chests from Standard, these contain mercenary-specific items, like mercenary packs and coins, so you can continue to expand and improve your mercenaries roster. We're incredibly excited to open up an entirely new way to PvP in Hearthstone, and now you know everything you need to get started, so it's up to you and your party. Good luck in the fighting pit, and we'll see you in Mercenaries.
Welcome back, everybody, to Master Store Stormwind, and it is round number two. We're halfway through the round, or rather, we're going to fill in until the round has ended. I have no idea how far through the round we are, <laughs> and we are going to have some more action from this round. Gia, how are you finding day one of the Master's Tour? How do you find them in general, not just necessarily this one? I find it strangely calming for a reason, Lorinda, just that we've reached the final stages of a meta, we've undergone the entire character arc of the development of the decks, and we are seeing a bunch of people going for just the good stuff lineup and the counter lineups, and we've come across what I believe is closer to a good stuff mirror here, with the exception that both players are including a mage, which is not widely considered one of the strongest archetypes right now, but I think has fair reasons to be played. It's got a strong matchup versus Handlock, and there's a couple Paladins running around that I think Mage farms. Yeah, the Paladins is a weird one. So we're now reaching a stage in the meta where we're starting to counter the counters, right? Is that what you're saying with the Mage? Uh, it's, it's decent as a counter in its own right, and it has some some okay matchups. And Maverick, honestly, whatever he brings is not a player I will argue with because he has been relentless in qualifying for these events as well as having a good result in one of the other tournaments. Um, he has been winning qualifier after qualifier after qualifier, like the seventh or eighth attempt. And for context, they're usually like 500 player plus qualifiers. And he just wins them for fun and has been doing for two years as well as being a very known strong tournament player. Um, in general so yeah i'm not going to argue but he is two zero down as we join the action here so let's see how he gets if he can get this done against a fell demon hunter which yeah. isn't the easiest thing to beat with this lineup i wouldn't have thought i suppose i should have appended an asterisk to when i called tian ming's lineup the good stuff because fell demon hunter not nearly the most meta demon hunter archetype at the moment that accolade goes to the otk demon hunter which maverick himself is running both players with their garot rogues band out of the way and now if we look at tian ming the fact that he has a fell demon hunter i wonder what he was hoping to target with it because it just has kind of fell off in this meta maybe still got a great matchup versus hunter mm -hmm. um i could see it getting there versus mage but it's a bit difficult because mage does have ways to um get some armor namely off of ice barrier and i think for the most part fell demon hunter does need to get some damage going face with attacks i did play a ludicrous amount of uh, fell demon hunter sort of at some point in the meta um and against the mage, you time your healing, which makes it very difficult for the mage over time. So you let the mage do their first burst, then you heal back up to 30 and force them to do it again. So that gives you not a fantastic matchup by any means, but it gives you an okay matchup against the mage. Maybe better than it looks at first sort of sight, just because of that. The fact that the mage has to do sort of 50 to you over the course of the match, if you play it right. But it's neither of those two we things. We are going to see the OTK. Yeah, sorry, Jim. Yeah, um, different kind of mirror, which, you know, strangely, I feel like should similarly function somewhat to that other matchup we were talking about, which is versus mage, except that both players have burst healing, right? So um, the fact that players have access to going from like 12 HP all the way back 30 makes me believe the matchup should be centered around who can get 30 plus damage all at once sooner and my inclination is to say otk demon hunter the deck is built to do that but um they do have access to less healing over the course of the game because they're not running the chase they do however have glide which can disrupt very important tools from tian ming because um the fell demon hunter what's important to them is getting skull in outcast position and turboing out jace yeah, this is almost the exact opposite of the mage thing I described. It's all in the hands of the OTK because they can kill you from 30, so your healing isn't as relevant as the, the Fell Demon Hunter. Meanwhile, the Fell Demon Hunter can't really kill you from 30. Somebody will go, oh, if you do this and this and this, we can kill you from 30. Yeah, yeah, you, you can. I know. I get it. But you can't really kill them from 30 very often. So the pressure is all on the Fell Demon is The opening hand look all right. He has the glide readied up for turn four, which will be able to outpace Tian Ming, outcasting his own skull. So if Maverick can put that back in Tian Ming's deck, it's a huge deal because he's already invested some uh, mana into banking that discount. 
with the Illidari studies. Yeah, I guess that initial part of the quest done nice and early. Well, not that early, but early enough. Um, very interesting to see the Moog just sitting on the board. It's really weird to do that. It feels against the OTK, but he does need to accumulate some damage from somewhere. Shifting that skull towards the left, but it's going to be two more turns. Um, are you there, Jim? Okay, we just might have an issue here. One second. Just going to try and sort out the issue. I bet you can do this! Um, because I have no idea, Jim and I can't hear each other, but we have no idea who can be heard. Just thought I'd explain that to you, because why wouldn't I? Alright, so here we go. I'm going to talk for a moment until Jia reappears. And it's Maverick who is trying to rifle through the deck now with Chiaming. <laughs> I assume getting glided while I was distracted there, because there's no longer that very nicely placed skull and he is left with a whole handful of nothing and this is not going to turn into a good hand anytime soon unless he can take a skull off the top which means that Maverick is going to just be able to at his leisure go through the quest and try to set up the OTK of course he doesn't know that Chiang Ming can do nothing but he'll have a good idea from the lack of anything happening that Chiang Ming's hand is pretty grim Maverick's one concern here will be um, in the mirror you'd be looking after your Curtis, but against the fell you just tend to sort of do the thing and hope they haven't found a glide from somewhere. So I'm Maverick so looking incredibly that. strongly placed. Gee, you're back. So sorry about that. Uh, I also have my feed frozen, so you should continue solo casting while I get everything okay. sorted. I shall continue this. I'm just letting Maverick solo play the game as well at the moment because Chen Ming's hand is pretty much a disaster and Maverick has just got all of the card draw that he could possibly want uh, he's going to be able to stick a Curtis in a turn or two and then he's going to be able to go 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 oh yeah I assume that Chen Ming's skull got glidden back in the time I was gone and oh a fell screen blast is also interesting obviously Maverick doesn't have that much spell damage right now but he could potentially get a Magtheridon of his own online, which is not insignificant for Fell Demon Hunter to deal with uh, because it's just hard to clear without using a ton of spell damage and it kind of blocks spell barrages, etc., from hitting Maverick's face, which is where Tian Ming wants them to go. He draws the skull! <laughs> so now he's back in it! <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's done well of looking after that. That's something he has been doing. Um, just in case it came off the top. I don't think you'd have expected it, but well played. This will get him right back in this. An Amorphous is discounted. Talented Arcanist. Fell Barrage. Not quite the nuts. I think to, in order to race a turn 6 Kurtris, he needed to get a discount on Ilganoth of his own. I don't think the Jace could be juiced enough by this point, even though I did miss a bit of the mid-game. Uh, Maverick's still really healthy, so even with these discounts, I think Tian Ming still needs to pull a miracle together. Maybe survive till around turn 8, and if you can get Ilganoth to go alongside this, maybe we're talking. Yeah, Metamorphosis is pretty handy. He can, he can get some damage in there over the next couple of turns. Top deck of Jace, do it again. That's his chance, I think. He knows he's a long way behind in terms of anything else he knows he'll be dead in like you say turn eight he's probably his optimistic survival mm. rate so play the metamorphosis start shooting some face get as much damage in as you can and top deck a jace and maybe Another get to nine he says with watery eyes <laughs> And Maverick with the top deck of a tradable is actually pretty nice. It lets him round out that last mana post Kurtris to keep flowing through the deck. And we see this a lot from Demon Hunter players after Kurtris. If you're going to start drawing through with other effects, you should proc the weapon first so you eliminate the possibility of drawing from your first tradable, the Persistent Peddler. Agtheridon is the draw for Tian Ming, which does allow him to clear the board and put some counter pressure on Maverick. 
Yeah, my first thought was it was optimistic. My second thought is what you're saying. It's like it's the only way he can win. It, it is optimistic, but he needs to be optimistic to win this game. So, yeah. the problem is if you play Magtheridon, the only way I'm seeing to clear all the one threes guaranteed is to use the zero cost talented Arcanist, which is a potential combo tool later on. But uh, like we were saying, even if yeah. he does draw Ilganoth, he needs to survive for a couple more turns even to put together his own combo. The discounts are just not enough. So I think he has to expend that talented Arcanist. Just try to win from board, no matter how optimistic it seems. I agree. And it's also not the worst time to have a 12-12, because if Maverick kills it, he'll only heal for three. Hmm. That's true. But yeah, it's like you say, it's optimistic, but it's required optimism. Which is the most pessimistic type of optimism, as it turns That's out. That's my kind of optimism, yeah. <laughs> sort of optimistic, but in a sort of sad, lonely fashion. Meanwhile, for Maverick, his only good draw spell here, it's not even a spell, it's the Persistent Peddler. The Glide, I feel, is a little bit expensive because he'd be tossing a lot of cards back in the deck. If he doesn't get anything good off the Peddler, I could see him dumping maybe Philosophy, I-Beam, even Immolation Aura, and then going for the Glide after. He has got to okay. deal with the 12-12, though. He can't, because there might well be 12 from hand against the Fell deck. That's true. And he can now with the Moargs. Um, well... He could even before that by playing the counter Magtheridon. Uh, but if he wants to, he can spend less mana doing this and then glide after. You'd have to use Philosophy Demon. 2 Morgs and I-Beam though. Demon. I'm not sure if that's worth it as opposed to just going Magtheridon, maybe Arcanist Felscream or Arcanist Immolation Aura. The glide does seem tempting just because it's going to be so natural hand refill for you. It's also tempting to outcast it if you just wait one turn, though. But again, I'm not sure how many Fell Screen Blasts he has left because of my gap in the middle of the game. I'm sorry. That's fine. I don't have Is the excuse, and I don't know either. Because <laughs> it starts to get tempting to outcast Glide as well because Tianming is accumulating quite a few cards for himself. This is the first turn... Um, or sorry, the last turn before a natural Jace is playable, so it's also pretty good timing for a outcast Glide from Maverick, potentially. Yeah. Now I am complete. He also has the option just would you would you dump the marks first if you're going to play the glide as well and just try and top deck lethal? I don't know how many of these he has left, but I mean there's definitely a guild trader still left in the deck, so I think one is dumpable. But I don't necessarily need to dump, just just play them and glide and find lethal there because you've played two oh. marks. That is optimistic because Glide would spend half your mana and Ilganoth would cost four. So okay. you would have to not spend any further mana on card draw. You couldn't afford an Acrobatics, for example. So kind of like the line Maverick's gone for here. Now that he's picked off the Ilganoth, though, I don't think you're supposed to Glide. What, you're just supposed to not die here. <laughs> How much damage is this? It's got to be lethal, right? Uh, uh, Ilganoth, Morg, Morg, I beam your Magtheridon deals 12, and then you fell screen blast for another 12. Yeah, it's 24. Cool. So that's going to be one game back for Maverick 2 1. Um, the early glide doing a lot of damage there, Chiang having to basically miss a couple of turns. Also, Magtheridon beating Magtheridon after me saying to Raven earlier that, you know, uh, Magtheridon doesn't have much impact in the matchups. <laughs> Just, just two of them killing each other. Nothing important. Mm -hmm. 12 damage winning the game. We're fine. I mean, you could put it that way. They cancelled each other out. It didn't have that big of an impact in the end. It was still the Elginoth. I mean, but obviously it had a very interesting dynamic in that it provides an additional, not quite board clear tool by itself because you still need to use some of your natural board clear to actually activate Magtheridon. But you get more bang for your buck with the board clear and you can create an alternate win condition, which is what Tianming was trying to go for with that board presence. You brought up a very good point that by leaving the 12 on board, Maverick sometimes dies to certain breakpoints. So he did have to go for either a clear on the mag or a counter lethal for himself. And it did come in a very timely fashion with the Ilganoth right off of that first Crimson Sigil runner. Maverick back on the board now. And Chiaming's still going to have this deck to get through. I'm just having a look what Maverick has left. He has left 
the mage, and I assume it's a handlock. Let me just double check. Ultra of Fire handlock as well, which I think is the standard for every list I've seen in this tournament so far. Ultra of Fire now, Jir, just seems to be a mainstay in the deck. It is only one copy, though, which I'd imagine that's a pretty good card to run versus Fell Demon Hunter because they are not trying to thin their deck specifically towards any one combo. Like you could argue, oh, if they got closer to Jay sooner, that's better. But there's so many cards that you burn and just them being a net negative for Tian Ming, things that he will never be able to play or see throughout the game is a big deal because those are all cards that he wants to load up the Jace with. And if you sometimes lose Jace itself or an Ilganoth, could have been huge but that's a moot point for now because maverick is gonna run the quest mage first which is featuring armor vendor um of all the minions i've seen in quest mage this is the least frequent i tend to see one thief and magtheridon before this but maybe maverick is looking for a bit more sustain versus the like of face hunters yeah i have no idea i don't get it. I mean, I, I'm one of these people who doesn't like to play minions in my mage unless forced anyway. In fact, I don't want to play mage unless forced, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> but playing the minions is is quite often just a pain from the spring water, etc. So, like you say, maybe he had this, this whole lineup to beat the counter decks in general and has decided that it's far more important to get that down and get that armor than it is to actually have a spring water when maybe when you're casting, you're kind of winning anyway. You did talk about this matchup a while ago where Mage doesn't quite have access to 30 to 0 most of the time unless you get mm -hmm. the nuttiest post Varden hand and you probably need to have two flows played um, by that point. So Demon Hunter sometimes has the window to heal back up. But this is a flow hand for Maverick and it's going to be followed up by refreshing Springwater in a couple of turns. He has the early barrier to keep that quest proc going. Nice. Um, I do think this is one of the Mage pan outs that can end up as a win, but we'll see. If for Tian Ming. He's already got Fel Barrage if he wants to send that face. I know it's without an Arcanist, but it just kind of spends the mana pretty nicely this turn, I feel. I'm a fan of doing that as well. Um, just, just get it spent because there will come turns where you really want to spend a lot of mana and you don't have any spare. He's going to be greedy. I, again, I would rather just cast it, but I will trust Tian Ming. He's had some incredible tournament results over his career. True. And that's the end of that skull. Forget that uh, part. <laughs> I mean, it will be playable, but a long time from now. And that's kind of why we were talking about spending the mana on the Fel Barrage, right? But I understand where Tian Ming's coming from. There is a lot of extra damage to be had if you just hold on to that alongside a talented Arcanist, especially since Mage, well, this list from Maverick is playing one minion. There's almost nothing that's going to get in the way of this Fel Barrage going face. Uh, but I wonder if it's worth the time he loses um, playing a later Skull, potentially. Gnar Glavesmith is more total damage, so I'd be inclined to take that. Demons. It is a minion on board, though, which you don't necessarily want to do versus Mage, so maybe, yeah, Dreadlord's Bite is better on second expectation. Yeah, I agree. And you probably don't swing with it because you don't want to give Maverick a chance to play a second barrier. It's a bit of a weird timing. I don't mind if you do swing, but I, I, my preference is to not swing with it in these spots. Also like of it. note... Yeah, uh, because there's still Warblades and he has this Fury, which he is going to swing eventually. Um, I just feel that you do it now. Like, Maverick doesn't really want to play Barrier again here, right? One of those precious Frost Spells while he's mm -hmm. still on quest level 1. No, that's absolutely fair as well. Gemini can also plan for playing a Skull with no Outcast. It's a very rare breed indeed, but looking how his hand's developing, just having three more cards, if he does have a turn where he doesn't have exciting things to do, can just be very, very big in this deck. He is just going to rip the Fel Barrage now, though, because he is looking to outcast the Skull. But already, look at what that two mana floated has done here, right? If he had two mana spare, mm -hmm. he could have already dumped the Fury at rank two and the Emolation Aura and played Skull on Curve. Now it's going to be delayed a whole turn, and I'm not sure what Tian Ming is doing with the rest of his mana on turn six. But meanwhile, for Maverick, the card draw doesn't stop here. He is looking for a target for his Frost Spell, so the Armor Vendor or a Primordial Studies would be pretty good. Doesn't quite hit it, though. <laughs> yeah. And this is going to be awkward for him. Ooh. Again, this is definitely now where you 
Next turn for Chen Ming's going to be horrible. What do you like here, Jia? You ooing. <laughs> the mask, just because it's a lot of damage, but then I look at it again and see these don't have spell schools. I guess Flurry does, but he has two of them and they're sitting dead in hand, so I retract my oh, ooh. These are not exciting. <laughs> oh no! I was looking forward to something exciting happening, but yeah. Um, I think you're right with the mask being the only useful card there, as things stand. Because he has a minion in his deck. Otherwise, a Pexis Blast might be okay. The Mask, if he truly has nothing better to do, if he truly cannot complete the quest and get Arcanist Dawn Grasp in hand, I can see the Mask maybe putting Tian Ming at an awkward health breakpoint, where maybe Maverick can threaten just having like Fireball Ignite from hand for lethal, and Tian Ming might have to use one of his heals. Uh, but that is a very theoretical world, and for now, Tian Ming is just going to go about this turn. Like we said, he's still not proccing the barrier. He's just completely committed to leaving that up. And I guess he might have a soft read on Maverick having another barrier in hand because he just has struggled playing Frost spells ever since that first barrier. I think I'd have killed my own Thanos there, honestly. Hmm. Last turn. Just to spend the mana again and get through the deck. It's okay, it will give you some extra damage, blah, blah, blah. But it's two more mana that is just going to be awkward to spend after this skull and after you draw some more cards. You might never get a Thalnos off. Agreed. Maverick does find studies, though. He was wishing for a Thalnos of his own, most likely, but ended up with a Solarian instead. I was honestly tempted as Maverick there to play Cram Session, even if it's just for two draws. I know it gets better with Varden, but I would like to get Varden in the first place, which involves drawing a couple more cards so you can target things with these Frost Spells. Another Rune Orb, maybe? <laughs> Flips the Brain Freeze, which would have been useful at some point, but not now, uh, during this turn. Cone is not very good. Still not playable, really. You just take another mask? Yeah, I kind of like this. It's just 20 damage from hand, right? <laughs> it, you are just kind of doing a slower Varden without having to finish the quest, if you want to look at it that way. has played so much Mercenaries that only 20 damage will suffice from any card. <laughs> that is not true. That is not enough to kill an Anduin or something. <laughs> Uh, so many people have wanted to kill Anduin for so many years. Right, Maverick trying to get it done the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Yeah, Maverick just deviating to the back-to-back -back skull game plan, which is, you know, like we talked about, this is the type of health total that Demon Hunter wants to heal up, and they can do very easily, but how many times can they do it that easily? There's two Fell Screams in the deck, there's not very many minions to target, and right now there's only... Thal knows for spell damage. Bear in mind, he had to dump a Moarg a while ago to get the skull in outcast position. He can, however, start loading up the Metamorphosis, maybe. Um, if you're holding off on proccing Ice Barrier for that long, I assume you just want to proc it on the turn you're killing Maverick. Yeah, or, or, if it, or make it so that if he does play it the next turn, you're probably just fine because it slows him down spending yeah. mana to play it and all that. You definitely want to play, you want to attack on the same turn that you leave minions on the board, is my assessment of that. If you're leaving minions on the board, they've got flowy anyway, you don't really mind them having another barrier as well. Ah, oh, Maverick just spends the mana for the one draw with the crab session. I respect it. He's all in on the mask game plan now. He's just looking for ignites, fireballs. It's not even about quest completion anymore. Yeah, this is the Celestalon way of playing mage. Just <laughs> throw things at the face. And it's starting to make Tian Ming panic. He's overwriting his weapon, so he's essentially lost four damage by not proccing Ice Barrier. He decides that it's too late to go for that game plan. I just need to stay alive now. This is the benefit of the back-to-back -back masks. Lost even more than four damage, right? Because there were hero powers he weaved in on previous turns that didn't get to go face. Okay, AI looking for ignites. Bringwater will do. Depending if he hits his one minion. Oh, that minion's oh. okay, though. Well, that's the barrier. Immediately redrawn. Uh, I'm not sure what his quest is at. It looks like it's just fire needed now, so you can get... Don Grasp in hand by dumping a fire sail if you want, or just trade one. Yeah, he can always just finish the quest with the 
hot streak for free anyway. So I guess the fire sales have more value as cards in the deck right now. Yeah, he's also got to decide if he wants to point this rune orb just at the face now. Because next thing he's going to no. have Salarian just to launch at the board. Runs out on me. Oh, that's true. I mean, next turn it's a toss up between Dawn Grasp or Solarian, right? It depends, I think, though, on whether he thinks he can just have lethal next turn if Tian Ming doesn't have any further healing because that Ruined Orb goes up to seven damage, uh, sorry, five damage with the Dawn Grasp, like a fireball off the top would account for lethal. And now it's Maverick killing his own minions. Mm hmm. Uh. It's a similar principle. Instead of like preventing Tian Ming from completing quests, though, he's preventing Tian Ming from having heal targets. Alina, put the Dawn Grass back. Nope. They okay. Never catch me. It wasn't that high odds, to be fair. Is he just looking for Jace at all costs here? I think so. And I think he's about to fell scream two of his own guys to outcast Skull. Or he could go Magtheradon, fell scream those, but then he doesn't get the Skull this turn. Yeah, he's just going for the Turbo Skull. And this is kind of the game plan I, I mentioned right at the introduction, where you just keep ticking along on the healing as the Demon Hunter. Mm -hmm. Which makes it very hard for the mage. And the fact that Maverick's playing the double flurry version means he hasn't been able to get the quest done quickly enough. Still going to be close. It is. Maverick's effectively at 28 with the second barrier up. Uh, Tian Ming can hero power and swing face this turn, which allows Maverick to maybe discover another barrier and play it. But I was interested just to weave in that extra damage because I don't know if this Jace is going to be enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but I, it's, I usually count on about 15 in the absence of a deck track or the ability to count. So I'm going with 15. There's been two Furies at three each. I think that's the first Chaos Strike. There's also been a fell barrage. Couple of barrages, one barrage maybe. So yeah, we're talking sort of in the 11 to 15, 17 range. It's, it's not lethal, put it that I way. Have but he is treading that line you were talking about where um, even if it's not lethal, the Jace can heal almost all the damage that yes. Maverick's going to put forward this turn. So Tianming might just buy himself enough time to deal lethal over two turns with a big enough Jace. It does involve, though, maybe saving that Ark and, uh, that Aldraki Warblades. So he that's why he didn't swing it last turn. Yep, that's absolutely why he didn't swing. Um, Chaos Strike into Jace is so much healing, and then just hope that Maverick doesn't OTK you, which, again, it can happen. It can definitely be done. Uh, I suspect that might even be why Maverick was saving those fire sails for so long, so he could get multiple ignites right at the end. Um, yep, could be. They ended up having to be used in the attempt to actually find a playable Hearthstone card, because look at his hand, it's full of junk. Yeah, it looks like these old Miracle Rogue hands without auction here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones that the Rogue would always show you at the end. Look, I had two preps. Yeah, well, you put them there. And a backstab. Yeah, you put I'm that there. Debating, though, if this is actually the Jace turn, he can still do it. And I think he does, because leaving the Dawn Grasp on board and not healing is just a little bit too risky for my liking. Yeah, this is a big old chase as well, this one. Right down at the bottom of the deck. It, it, it's not lethal for the barrier. I was going to say it could possibly be 20, but I don't think it's lethal for the barrier. But like you highlighted, the healing is ginormous here, so he should be absolutely fine. So two. He's up to 14 attack plus the metamorphosis ping. Okay, 16. I didn't even count everything yet. It was still going. So Maverick will be at 8 at the end of this, and he has to deal 30. Prime can do it. Prime can do it. Easy. Five masks. two masks a while ago. You just need three now. Oh, and the Fireball wow. can be played with Hot Streak as well. So you start with Prime, right? So you get the spell damage from the Fireball mm -hmm. if your Prime lives, and you have to assume it lives because we are being optimistic here as Maverick now. Oh. If you do oh. 10. That's one. That's a whiff. That's a whiff. It's short. 
Maverick's entire this hand. Is dealing another 10, and then the ping deals two because of wildfire, but not enough. <laughs> Wow, that was so, so close. Just try to check it's over. Yes, there's Nilgin in hand. It's over. That's good. Uh, Six, eight. I mean, you can't really make this all go to Maverick's face at the moment because the Prime is still at a lower health total than Jaina here. Uh, so the Fel Barrage will still hit the minion. No, but he's got the, the metamorphosis, so he pings first. Oh, he does, you're right. And then barrages, because um, it will be, the Jane will be on three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. ah. He does not, however, know what the secret is. Maybe he's playing around counter spell, or I don't think he can afford to, yeah. No other spells to play, but just a little bit of hesitation because that secret is always an X factor. But nicely done by Tianming. Yep, goes to two and zero. A great start, Tianming, and a tough one for Maverick, who, again, is somebody I just love to see do well in these events because he's done so well in qualifying. He did so well in the old Masters system before this one, and would love to see him get to another big final. And I'm sure it'll happen, but maybe not at one and one in an eight rounds of Swiss. It's got it, got it to do from here. Yeah, it is an uphill climb for sure. It is always demoralizing to go down um, early on in a Masters Tour. I have felt that feeling and I have dropped out because of it. But, you know, when you're not in a foreign country, you don't quite have that consolation of let <laughs> me just go enjoy the city. It's still got to be hunker down and play the rest of the rounds. There is points and money on the line. There is GM promotion to think about. So I hope that Maverick can pull it back together and turn it around. Meanwhile, for Tian Ming, though, just continuing the story of the dominance of our Chinese players, it could very well be another Chinese player winning this Masters Tour. I think they would have like over 50% win rate, like not just win rate in Swiss, but winning entire Masters Tours. I think more than half of our champions have been from China this year. This year, yeah, it's getting that way. Um, over the, the time, it, over the whole of the Masters Tour system, it must be slowly but surely getting there as well. Uh, but we are going to jump into another match now. Between two players, I've got to admit, I don't know much about without having access to any notes. So LZ John versus Lona. Um, you're going to be able to correct that for me, I'm sure. Uh, nope, I don't know them either. I'm so sorry, Lorenda. <laughs> we have no idea what we're jumping into. Let's have a look there. But it's good to see uh, the players we know little about having a shot on the stream. Let's see what we can yeah. learn about them as they play. As soon as we see the flags, we'll be able to confirm what region they're from as well, which is very important because, of course, we are approaching the end of the year. We know who's relegated from GM at the end of the season, and we'll get to see what are the odds that they can promote into the next season. Because even though we're not familiar with them, whether or not this is their first MT, you can just leapfrog so many other people with one big spike performance in an MT. LZ John going to queue up his Death Rattle Demon Hunter, which is a deck that has been brought way more than I thought it would be um, to this master store. I assume people like it versus OTK Demon Hunter. That's a matchup that has traditionally been Death Rattle Demon Hunter favorite even before the introduction of the quests. And it does have quite a lot of sustain versus other decks that want to go for one big board clear like Handlock. If everything has Death Rattle, then Soul Rent sometimes isn't good enough. But I just feel like the overall power level of the deck is so low. It's not very flexible. It really wants to hit a curve, and you can't always have that. Yeah, we've seen a lot of this already today. I'm curious how much is out there. Just did a very quick search through my stats. Um, Lona, this is his either 12th or 13th. I believe it's his 12th Masters Tour, running oh. just literally two games under 50%, so absolutely down the middle, uh, 35, 37 players. So... Basically, a 50-50 player, someone who's very experienced, and you find with those players, they eventually have a breakthrough. They either keep coming back and going 50% and go, what's the point in this? Or they keep coming back, and if you come back this many times, something clicks and you suddenly make a breakthrough and get to that next level of wins. So, very interesting to see how Lona performs here. I'm honestly upset at myself that he's been to 12 Masters Tours and I don't know the name very well. That's my bad there. But, you know, 12 Masters Tours, that is not 
a feat to knock whatsoever. It means that he has been competing at least since 2019 and at nearly the highest level, like the highest you can do if you're not a Grandmaster. It takes a lot of effort to qualify into a Masters Tour. We've cycled through a lot of different methods, um, whether Lona's done it through win rate, through qualifiers this time, or ladder, I think it is something to be lauded. And he is bringing a very special twist on Garot Rogue. Um, oh, it's yoinks! Yeah, there is a Yoink and Silver Leaf Poison in this list. I was not kind of confused if I was looking at Weapon Rogue or not, but it is Garot Rogue with the Field Contact in there, just with a little bit of added additional draw options. And that does make some sort of sense, right? Because the Weapon Rogue quite often wins through the Garot method anyway as a backup plan, or even... You might even claim it's the main plan if you wanted to argue that. I don't think I could argue against it. And so splitting the two together, yeah, I can see how that works. A little bit of checking up as well, um, LZ John. It's also very similar stats, actually. This is his 10th Masters Tour. And again, 32 wins, 33 losses, absolutely middle of the road. So an opportunity for one of these two players to break out today, both at 1-0 and playing each other. Indeed. Both are players from the APAC region, indeed, which is a very um, good sign for them. There's six open slots in APAC right now with our four relegations and two retirees. There's a lot that the points can gain you just by winning every single round. Uh, nice opener for LZ John here. This is the nice death rattle synergy where they kind of one pulls out the other instead of one just having to be a bluff or one being redundant with another. Uh, the renowned performer also can be coined out next turn if he wants to follow up with a glide, which has eternally been one of the most difficult cards for the Garot Rogue to play around. I wonder if that came mm -hmm. into Lona's deck building decision making. Just the fact that you can equip Silver Leaf Poison in such a way, or like you can have that effect on a weapon you've equipped mm -hmm. and bank that card draw. It's not affected by glide. Uh, it strikes me as somebody who just got sick of not drawing field contact one too many times. Like, right, what else draws cards? Just find me some more stuff to draw cards, because one too many times my field contacts were both bottom five. But this yoink... I mean, I'm somebody who has not rolled Warlock on Yoink one too many times and quickly removed it from my Garot Rogue death list after testing Give Please's list. Um, we can see for Lona, it has given him, I guess, an additional clearing power versus some of the piddly minions that El Zijon will be putting forward here. But it's just such a low impact card if you're not able to hit the card draw, in my opinion. Always very tough to know what to do as the Rogue in these spots because you know that the more things you kill early of the demon hunters, the less impact you have. If you wait till their hand starts to empty a bit, yeah, good luck with that. Then there's less chance of things pulling other cards from each other. But you're also busy facing this avalanche of damage that starts coming towards you starting about now. So it makes it really hard to pilot the rogue in these spots, I find. Yeah. Your removal just runs out. Lona also roped at the end of that turn. I'm not sure if he had the option to backstab what the 2-2 would look like there last turn. He's just going to stab it now, which makes me think if he had full time to see what that was, he would have stabbed it last turn. Uh, but what he's been doing is actively dumping cards from the hand, making that glide less and less impactful from LZ John, who did not choose to go for the coin performer because he picked up this 3-3, um, which will be able to pull it out from the death rattle instead, not looking to waste the effect on that. Um, the post-passage hand for Lona is extremely awkward. In fact, the yoink is bad for him right now because he can't re-equip the rogue hero power to get an additional charge from the silver leaf poison. <laughs> Uh, and this is where the silver leaf poison is very good. Uh, but again, he had a specific plan in mind with this and I assume tested it a lot. And there's a lot to be said for bringing a deck you are comfortable with, even if it's a bit weird looking to tournaments. Because your opponents don't know what to do about it, and you do. Oh. Gain percentage points that way. LZ John looking to continue the curve, not going for the glide because this isn't Quest Demon Hunter. There's no immediate benefit just to gliding. It doesn't give you any discounts. So he is dumping as many cards from his hand as possible and also waiting for Lona to maybe have more than four cards in hand before the glide happens. But Lona, I think, has been consciously playing around that. Uh, maybe he can't avoid it, though, because the Shroud of Concealment is 
the only decent thing that comes off of this passage right now. Yeah, I don't know about consciously, but he's going to be unconscious in a minute if he's not careful. This damage is coming in so <laughs> rapidly on the other side. Um, another thing to wait for before gliding could be the, the Octobot as well. So no hurry for John, but he may just have to next turn. But he, he doesn't have to use the Outcast one. He does have that choice, depending how the hands look. I do think he will coin before gliding because that's certainly not a card you want to draw back. Lona with the prize plunder, not an ideal use of Shadow Step really, but he is just trying to delete cards from his deck. This version with the Talented Arcanist, you don't need as many Shadow Steps to get the combo done. You can be a bit more liberal with your Ethereal Aug Merchants as long as you can get to the bottom of your deck and have the Talented Arcanist proc on all the bleeds. But the glide is going to put a stop to all that. LZ John picks oh. up Neophyte to follow up the rest of the turn as well. That's super clean. Just don't look at the bottom half of the board. It's just a hand of nightmares are made of. I guess there is a swindle. It might improve. But Lona's next turn is very much a consolidation one. Interesting that he chooses to re-equip Tusk Piercer rather than play Neophyte. I mean, I don't think LZ John's highest priority is necessarily cycling with his deck, I thought it would just be make sure you have a weapon equipped and still with a charge on it by turn 7 so that turn 8 you can immediately get the Inquisitor to go face. But he's planning something different. He's just trying to keep drawing through the deck, maybe looking for uh, Death Speaker Blackthorn to have a powerful turn 7. Yeah, that makes sense as well. Um, again, I, I tend to be the opinion that you, you die on turn eight against normal rogues. You can add a turn because you've managed to interfere with their plan so much. Yeah. But Lona's forgotten to draw a field contact. You know what I was saying earlier about, <laughs> hey, this is the look of a man who's had his field contact in the bottom five once too many times. Uh -huh. That's that look that we all know. We've all been there. Lona's was the hand gesture of a man who's had his field contact lighted back every single time I've <laughs> been there. Uh, so for John now, he has seen Swindle, Secret Passage, and Shroud of Concealment. So the Cult Neophyte, in terms of being disruptive in the mid game, I feel that window has closed. I still think he's going to play at least one here, maybe, just to have the pressure keep rolling. Uh, but it's worth thinking about saving them for if you have to block a combo later on. Yeah, this is the tough choice, right? There's only nine cards left in Lona's deck, so LZ John could be dead next turn in some worlds, not many worlds. Legendary. But he could just develop the two three drops and go double near fight next turn, which basically sets up... True. But again, he's prioritizing allocating some mana to card draw. He's used up his weapon as well, so he's not about the Inquisitor whatsoever. He right. just feels like he's about to die, I think. All he was looking for is Blackthorn or another Glide. Just wants to be disruptive rather than leaning towards his own game plan, which, you know, for the most part has been working out here. But mostly, I think, because Lona hasn't drawn the field contact back. <laughs> yeah, I quite like the idea. Again, cast division really helps, but near fight something, near fight something else, hit you with Inquisitor, win the game. I felt like that was a good three turn setup that was unlikely to lose, but. Again, very easy to say that when I can see there's no field contact in the opposing hand. Yes. It just felt somewhat like a handlock way of going about things, right? Delay, delay, threat. <laughs> but is going for Blackthorn actually any quicker? Doesn't it still just win on turn 8, like the line we just discussed would win on turn 8? That's Close. Concern. I can't tell. Because you play the Blackthorn on seven and great, it's wonderful, etc. But you have to wait till turn eight to attack anyway, which is kind of the same thing, except you do less damage in the meantime. I grow impatient. Something we're thinking about, but the Fell Screamer pickup does mean he gets to play and have the Inquisitor attack on turn eight, which is a big deal. Um, doesn't get to play Fell Rattler, but that's all right. We've talked about how neophytes are something of a priority right now just to prevent any possibility of counter lethal this turn and <laughs> Luna has Sorry. like so little removal I mean he can't even stay alive even if he removes the neophyte because Illidar Inquisitor is 9 damage including the hero power plus the 4-4 that's 13 hmm. he can just... kill the fell screamer but he has to play a garrot here to bounce the pen flingers back Right, yeah. And he absolutely has to win next turn, even in the world where he survives this turn, I think. 
And he I don't know if that's possible. Draws. Yeah, I mean, he needs to set up for good draws, right? He needs to set up as if the next mm. card is definitely field contact. So that would imply, I think, Octobot, ping it with Penflinger, use the other Flinger on a 4-4, four -four. Uh, Garot, oh uh, no, you need all four flings to hit the 4-4 four -four to stay alive. Man, maybe you just don't play Octobot. Yeah, and now the Garot bleeds are going to have to be in the right place as well, because you've got to do 28 <laughs> next turn, so you're going to need spell damage. Oh. I mean, it's possible. I mean, not even accounting for LZ John drawing literally any additional damage here, which would be lethal. Um, if Luna top decks field contact, he can go like Garot contact and then Arcanist. And then if he draws all the bleeds right off the Arcanist battle cry, that's lethal. <laughs> cool. Solved. What could go wrong? Uh, I think John should know that that out is so mm. unlikely, though. So the game plan is still inquisit face. Yeah, and kill these two um, flingers because that's card draw. I, I, I don't know what John... John must be wondering, what on earth is my opponent's hand? It must be completely trash. Do you kill the pen flingers? Because you can put Lona to one, right? Like, if yes. you leave one up. And that means your hero power is lethal next turn, even if there's some, like, one thief disaster that clears your board. I don't know. Again, with the Sorry, benefit of no the deck tracker, it's probably more straightforward. <laughs> Let's say, like, Brain Freeze is found here for Lona. Okay, he is just gonna clear it, though. Okay, well, never mind. Moot point, Lona's dead. Just never got into it after the glide. Didn't really get into it much before the glide, but certainly in the post-glide world, oh, okay. um, Lona's just not had a hand that does anything, even with all the extra card draw in the deck. He had used the yoink and the poison before the glide. That's not ideal, right? You'd want to draw your cards after you've been glided, but it's easy to say that. Maybe he's included those in his deck so he can do that and still have extra card draw still in his deck. But he did use up his card draw, he did get glided, and now it's down to two all here. So we're going to go to the deciding game. Which will be Paladin versus Garot Rogue, and this variant of Paladin is not Librams, it's the aggro with secrets in it, um, which I would say has a very polarizing matchup versus Rogue. I think it's strongly Rogue favored, but um, it can sometimes pan out where if the rogue has not put forward any tempo in the early game, all the paladin has to do is stick a sneaky delinquent, then stick a blessing of authority on that, and then go face with Wind Fury. That wins games. It's really hard to set that up though, because in the meantime, rogue will be playing a bunch of small minions, and you don't have the benefit of running as many taunts as Libram Paladin would, or as much healing, more, more importantly. How did the Jungle Panther never come back into this deck, Jir? It was amazing. <laughs> um, it was there for like people found days. out Goody Two Shoes was that with Divine Shield. <laughs> ah, so distressing. It was such a good deck. And by and Battle Master cost five in those days as well, uh, which helped. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. But yeah, this deck is is pretty straightforward in what it's trying to do, like you've described. And how do you feel about watch posts today, specifically in this tournament? I think there might be too much aggro for them to be a good call today. I think they're still decent. That's a problem card for OTK Demon Hunter to deal with. So if your lineup is built to deal with that, then sure. And I think it does make sense. LZ John's lineup does seem at least somewhat decent versus Demon Hunter. He has the Quest Rogue rather than Garot Rogue, which some people say is Quest Rogue favored versus OTK Demon Hunter. He's just not hit the soft target in Lona's lineup. So he's in a bit of a distressing position now. But first, Lona has to meet a couple criteria to actually win the early game. One of those is Octobot, mm -hmm. not there, but uh, Prize blenders are pretty decent. I don't think anything really gets played this turn. It's probably like a dagger game plan. He can set up, though, for eventually a big board clear. And I was going to ask you, but I was too slow whether to coin dagger or not here. So why why wouldn't you coin dagger there, do you feel? Just too slow with a coin? 
Yeah, I mean, it does make sense if all you're trying to do is get rid of minions. Redaggering kind of keeps pace with these small minions that LZ John's trying to play, but I think the coin is too valuable to pair with your prize plunderers. The minions will get bigger than 1-1, one, one, and just having free mana and really? flexibility for your combos and an additional buff on the prize plunder damage is too valuable, in my opinion. That makes absolute sense to me. I like it when you describe things Ooh. to me, because you say it nice and simple so I can understand. Thank you. <laughs> And our next episode of Mullet Over. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Louis do ask more stupid questions. Yep, here's the reward of keeping that coin though. Um, going into this turn, going to the next turn, the prize plunderer, as you described, kicking off something a bit bigger. And suddenly the board looks under control for the time being, but also actually got field contacts and Octobots present. Yeah, that's huge. But John gets to put forward a carrial roam with nothing challenging on, on the board, that's actually really tough for Lona to deal with having used a prize plunder. He can at least brain freeze it, which is a big deal. The prep is an enormous top deck as well because he can use that with Swindle and then discount what comes off of the Swindle with the Octobot potentially. How do you feel about oh, plundering Octobot first here? It's quiet. And then what? It's exact hand, quiet. and then um, brain freeze, carry on and just chill. Going to see oh, the next turn and play a load of cards. Not sure if it's enough, uh, because you would reduce two field contacts and a swindle, right? Mm -hmm. And the prep doesn't actually get that much value because the swindle's down to one anyway. But this line I didn't really think about, which is just play the field contact, which is honestly pretty reasonable that it would stick, because Carrial Rome and Samuro are the only rush minions for this Paladin deck. I think. And there's like not that much other damage available from hand. They're sort of the Fallen, but that's one damage short of being able to clear a field contact. So Lona's taken a calculated risk. And even if there is the Samuro, which John does have, Lona has access to second field contact. Yeah, and also it's a five mana turn where you've developed two attack. Like this is the worst case scenario for Lona. And sure, okay, have your two attack samurai. That's that's not a disaster. Backstab is the pickup for Lona here, which can help him test for Oh My Yog. Only two cards played, so he still does not know whether or not this is Galloping Savior. Um, I think it's safe for him to go field contact and then. Oh uh, no, that's all the mana used. Maybe this just isn't a contact turn. We're gonna find out. Okay. So now he stabs, plunders Carriol, and then he begs his deck to give him Shadow Step from this secret passage, I think. Yeah, okay. See, if you're going to go this line, I would rather go last turn, proc the Octo, play double field contact, and beg for Shadow Step this turn anyway. Oh, man, I have rarely gone for double field contact turns. <laughs> TJ knows I'm a, I'm a double field contact gamer. Not very often, but when, when you can reduce them and they have a good chance of drawing a lot of cards and bouncing one back, it is sometimes a play I like to go for. True, but if they both get cleared, that's your win condition gone. And that's why Lona decides to step one back, even though that was a juicy prize plunder step to get rid of the Samuro. The fact is the 3-1 living means that that last field contact could have died, which means Lona's guaranteed Garot combo is gone towards the end of the game. So just going to have to deal with the board next turn, hopefully. Yeah, it's not getting board. out of control particularly fast considering it's a Paladin opposite. John has access to a full clear with swing and double trade. He can draw off the North Watch commander as well. Seems decent. We'll fight back these brutes. Yep. Managing to get enough damage on the board for this turn, but previous turns have been a bit too slow, I think. Okay, I know what the silver leaf poison is for. It's to proc Oh My Yog. It's clearly the most useless card in this hand, right? <laughs> But yep, the thing is, you works. cannot play it unless you have a weapon equipped, so you have to spend three mana to proc Oh My Yog here. Is that worth it? So many <laughs> options. <sighs> I think so. He's not under that much pressure. Okay. I thought the passage looked pretty valuable here, but... Yeah. Fair enough. I guess Silverleaf can be two draws as well. Oh, and he just gets raised dead? Are you kidding me? That's insane! Oh, here we go! He just another Octobot! Hello? <laughs> he's going to have to go if he's doing anything this turn. He is, he's used a lot of his time already. Yeah. 
I mean, this is super clean though, right? You can just go like pen flinger, prize plunderer, step the uh, field contact again. Um, that is both steps used and one aug merchant, but he does play talented Arcanist, so it's okay. All he just needs to do is retain a field contact, I think. Um, he could also just leave the field contact instead because after he kills the Samuro, John has no more damage from hand, I believe. Right? Uh, that's what I think as well, yeah. Let me just check the list, but that's what I felt. We, we saw the carry all go, so... Seems likely. Yeah, so I was kind of into maybe just leaving the contact on board then, because there's literally no more damage for John. Still uh, plenty of card draw in his hand though, because he's still got the, the poison, so yeah. that's good. <laughs> No, that needs a contact. Let me think. Well, a bit of a disaster for John. He does have at least a guaranteed blessing of authority target, and he has another swing to maybe get him some more disruption. But like, it's not even a two-turn lethal setup to go blessing of authority here. He doesn't have the battlegrounds battle master in hand, and Let if he does go blessing, think. he's not able to play Northwatch commander as well. Boonfang looks very sad as well against an opponent that plays Penflingers and discounts them to zero. Yeah, it's still slow though. Like, it still costs quite a bit to fling around, but... I mean, John's got to do something. He's going to lose in probably next turn when he can't do anything about that, but he's definitely going to lose the turn after, so he has to set up some attempt at it, and he's done that. Okay, true. Okay, I forgot to account for Samuro going face first before buffing. He just doesn't trade here, so he's setting up for the Battlegrounds Battlemaster top deck for a lethal. Uh, but this should be pretty easy for Lona to dispatch. He has... Um, <laughs> yoink again. There's still, I think, a Brain Freeze in the deck, so even if he doesn't kill the Samuro, just freezes it, he's okay, and he can kill the horsey with the SI7 extortion plus a pen fling. Insufficient. And he got lethal of his own. There's one Garot in hand, but the other is still in the deck, so questionable, I will say. Yeah, I've lost track of how much spell damage he has available too, if I'm perfectly honest. It's enough. Yeah. Yeah, this is the last spell damage aside from Arcanist, so... Fling, fling... Oh, okay, yeah, 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 it's there, it's there. So you just extort to put the flingers back, you play one more battle cry, so your deck has zero. Then you go Garot, and then Arcanist, right? Yep. Uh, although that's only one Garot, so... Yep, <laughs> it's only the one. Three, and then... Th it's, I think, 18 damage? Yeah. Not quite, not quite lethal, but it's lethal in effect because what he's done here is prevent John from having an out for the Battlegrounds Battlemaster. He can't even clear this board because that's the Samuro already gone, but even without this board damage, Lona just goes Garot Garot, play the Arcanist, and then trade back the Extortion, and because of the Arcanist interaction, which will make all the bleeds deal four, that's lethal. Yep. Or he could choose to use the poison, it's but yeah. Not too heavy. <laughs> I want to see it do something. True. He called it as the worst card in the deck. It's just sat there for the whole match by the look of it doing nothing. <laughs> I mean, if he does use it, though, it has to be before the Arcanist is played because the Ar it will eat up the Arcanist interaction, unintended yep. interaction that buffs the bleeds. <laughs> That'd be a funny way to do it. But even then, that's not even accounting for the spell damage he sticks on the board and the field contact that's sticking because, once again, this Paladin deck has very little interactivity. It is not built to deal with Garot Rogue boards. It is built to prey on Demon Hunter, maybe Handlock as well. That's not the case here. Lona is going to take the series 3-2. to two. Yeah, bit scrambly, uh, but got there in the end. I'm not sure entirely what I feel about this build of the Rogue, but when somebody brings a deck to a Masters Tour who's been going to many Masters Tours and running as a 50% record, you've got to at least respect the, the potential for the deck to be good. Yep. And he has got it done, so it goes to 2 and 0. Oh. Mm, congratulations to Lona, although I did kind of like what we saw from John, just at least in terms of lineup building. I think um, the likes of Bunny Hopper and Alan 
struck gold um, a couple weeks ago at the Grandmasters playoffs, and that meta has largely been retained until now, where you can bring a certain build of Paladin, a certain build of Rogue to maybe soft target Demon Hunters. John just hasn't hit that target versus Lona, but maybe later on, as he faces more of the field, that is more likely to happen. He can still turn it around. And I'm also happy to see some uh, unfamiliar faces in APAC because I think both our players were very expressive. They looked invested in the game, which I love to see. When we have greats like Surrender and Tiz retiring, I'd like to see the people replacing them have all the further fervor they had at the beginning. But is that another messy bed I see behind Lona? <laughs> it might be. The judge of the APAC players. Uh, the That's we have, we have... the bed or not. <laughs> No, we have Killing All Day, whose bed looks just like it's straight out of a showroom. So America's, as always, is like the best region for these things. But maybe we'll see how the play goes as the day goes on. <laughs> right. Um, so I think that's the end of round two. I better just check that because I'm not actually sure. Um, but we are going to try and get round three set up for you. So we will be back in just a moment with round number three here at Master Store Stormwind. <laughs> 